Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole meeting and welcome all members of the committee and welcome everyone watching us on the live stream uh, this evening. We're glad that you're with us. So the second item on the agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if they have a pecuniary interest that they'd like to declare at this time. Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions or deletions. We have no open forum. Uh, we do have one delegation this evening and it is from Joanne Robbins and she's here to talk to us about 2020's Pumpkin Fest celebrations. And so uh, we'll bring Joanne in. Well, that's not Joanne. No, this is really. not Joanne. Joanne is much better looking. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Joanne and I are sort of tag teaming you tonight. Uh, John Miller, I'm his vice president this year. So thank you for the opportunity to update you guys. Thanks, welcome, John. Welcome. Tracy. Tracy is going to help me out here, of course, because anybody that knows me knows my skills, and there's a reason that I'm at Joanne's tonight. Uh, <laughs> so we do have a little presentation here for you guys tonight. Thank you. Oh, go back to the start a little bit more up to slide one or two even. Again, there. there we go. Thank you, Tracy. And just go to the next one. Um, so again, I uh, thank Council and those tuning in tonight to, uh, for the opportunity to bring up what we've been up to. Um, our year started out great in this January and February's meeting. Uh, we had the biggest plans and we were going to see the biggest amount of people you've ever seen on the streets of Port Elgin this year at the festival. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Um, COVID-19, like everything else this year, has changed our event. Um, again, Obviously, we've made some serious changes in that we will be having no public attendance this year. The street festival, carnivals, market vendors, those type of things where we, live visitation will not be happening. And again, sorry, Dave, uh, Councillor Dave there, but uh, no, no static car show this year either. Um, it, it just isn't the right time for it to get, it, get together in that type of a setting. We were really hoping that, you know, back in April and May, we were holding out hope. It's not going to happen. What we do have is a, a very strong team committed to making sure that we have something to celebrate this year in 2020. And again, this is what we'd like to bring you up to date with tonight. Um, if you could skip one more ahead here and I'm gonna go with my paperwork. Um, what we looked at is our Bruce Power International Way Off and what is it about? What, what is it we have to do? And it, the mainstay of this event, it has been the way off for our growers. These people that are growing and have been working hard at these things started long before we ever heard of what a COVID was gonna be. Um, so what we wanna make sure is that we have a safe and official site with proper social distancing measures, but we still need to be official so that people can have a spot to weigh in their giants. What we have gone ahead with is we've um, working with a professional production crew and we will be doing the broadcast. It will be online live that day from the location, pumpkinfest.org from our location, and we will be continuing with the way off. Um, again, under these regulations and things that we're dealing with, we have some very strict rules of an in and out policy. Uh, we won't be allowing any congregating, which anybody that knows has dealt with farmers and pumpkin growers is not always an easy thing because they do like to stop and chat. And of course, as always, we have uh, had an interesting year in 2020. So we have heard some rumors of some really big ones up to the point that we actually spent some time, Doug Court and I, and we have upgraded the size of our ability to weigh this year, just in case. So we do have some new ones that way. Again, you'll see at the bottom there, real fun, virtually delivered is what we're going for and we wanna keep them in. Uh, update on a couple of things that we have gotten okayed and we're going ahead with here is OPG is one of our sponsors have come in and we've made a range print for what we're calling curbside pickup Wednesday program. And this is where families could pick up a free pumpkin kit, fun activities. Some of our sponsors um, take materials home safely and then, of course, we're going to invite them later on to, uh, you know, send us pictures, entries, if you will, almost to uh, see what they've done. Um, again, the Saugeen, Saugeen Valley Conservation, McGregor Point Park, the Saugeen Métis have all volunteered. And we're going, to, we're going to put together a good package for them and give the kids something to do. You know, we want to keep the activities. It can't all be about going back to school or not going back to school. Um, again, dates right now, 3 to 5 p.m. on the Wednesdays before Pumpkin Fest, September 16th, 23rd and 30th. And some people may know that Highbury Farm location. It's a good open location. And uh, you know, might be a spot to get a pumpkin or two as well. Um, thank you, Trace. Go ahead, one more. The uh, car show, 
again, haven't left out our car show people. Again, they want to take part. Um, so what we are working on is a rolling car show. It's going to be on the Sunday. Um, and again, public are encouraged to watch from their porches, parks, sidewalks while public while practicing the social distancing. We're going to have two routes, a north and south route that will include drive-bys by the hospitals and seniors residents. Um, and participants, we are asking them to pre-register because we are hoping for, you know, one of our plan calls for 600 cars that day. So we're hoping for some good numbers and a good event to happen on the Sunday. Uh, staging times from the Plex will be, in, you know, definitely uh, implemented and we're, again, no public access or viewing would be available. Next on our list is if we're going to put this show together, John is learning a lot of things about things called storyboards. Um, something that I've never worked with before, but we want to have a proper presentation, something that people are willing to tune into and watch for the day. Um, so as of that, we are um, going around right now and we're actually well, some of it, we talk about local bands are being taped and we're going to have some live shows, things just for the event, creating activities for the event, done earlier and done available. Our Bruce Telecom Harvest Star Search, we're going to have categories and events for the kids. Of course, this will be where we highlight our pumpkin carving during the day and some of the um, great activities we think, seem to look for. Decorating contests, we're having home, we're having business contests, and again, things that people could do safely and then we're able to judge and uh, of course celebrity seed spitting many of our counselors have been involved in that previous year years and we're looking at doing that as well this year and having that about available for the day and then working with one of our local dance studios we have now have out there an official pumpkin fest dance for the harvest star 2020 um, if i could swing my hips that well i'd be a much better golfer is what i can say <laughs> Um, but again, this is something we want to do. We're going to create these activities so that people have something to do and we're looking for activities to get involved in. We want to keep the whole community out there and give them something to look forward to. Um, the bingo. Again, most people realize other years we've had a huge successful, um, you know, dance music festival. Again, it's just not going to be suitable for this year. So working with our friends with the Alliance Club, who again run the regular bingos through the week, we're going to run a special bingo. It will be aired that night, 6, 6.30 sort of start time um, on Bruce Telecom and pumpkinfest.org. And again, we're hoping for $2,400 in cash prizes that night. And it is something the whole family can do together. Again, keep track of us at pumpkinfest.org where to get your tickets, uh, your tickets. So it shows you how much I know of bingo. I believe they're called bingo cards, <laughs> but we will be doing it live that night from the Alliance location and to something, again, to continue the day and many people are missing their bingo. Uh, again, the other part we're looking at, Pumpkin Fest gives back. Um, many organizations and festivals, we have been a major fundraiser for them for the year. This is where their funds come from. So again, with the idea of the Lions Club, um, that, you know, we do hope to make some proceeds from that. And we can share that around other different um, other places. People can do some fundraising. The uh, Port Elgin Rotary, of course, has always has stepped up and they will be doing the pre-ordered from their website to get the pies. And I haven't even heard they might be doing some celebrity deliveries and things. So we're looking forward to that. Also with this protest or with, with the presentation of what we're doing is the um, donation buttons. So while people are there for the day and some of the different sponsors, we're looking at some of these events like we've got listed here, where maybe somebody hasn't had an opportunity to go ahead and donate safely to them. They know that these groups need help. And so this is an opportunity for us to bring them into that as well. Um, again, this is where I'm going to trade it off to Joanne because this is the boring paperwork stuff. In each of the packages that were there, there's the different things. But I'm going to turn this over to Joanne and let her speak now. Thank you, John. Good evening, everybody. So John went through that very quickly but we are really looking forward to seeing uploads of uh, pictures of all those carved pumpkins, all the talent, uh, local talent that we're pre-taping. I think it will be a fun day. As we take the pumpkins off the scale, uh, we can show pictures of our celebrities spitting their seeds. Um, uh, certainly there'll be some dropped off at the uh, community complex for our counselors. And we're asking you to tape that in the safety of your own backyard. And we'll be doing that through the day. Um, now I'm gonna go through, in your packages, I included a way off traffic flow, um, car show routes. I will leave it to your discretion to go through those. If you have any 
comments or questions on those, certainly get a hold of me. Um, Breakers Health has vetted both of those uh, and has deemed them appropriate for COVID-19. And I have forwarded those to the police and fire services. Um, Phil got back to me. Um, so, you know, I, we're, we're trying to do everything right and safe and uh, keep everyone that's involved safe. Um, the permission and request document you have uh, has the road closure. Now we're only, we don't need Highway 21 this year. We, um, we only need the same four block radius where we had the street festival. And that's where, if you look at your maps, you'll, it makes it quite clear. We're using that area to, to bring in our pumpkins, um, load them in the one Zamboni door of the old arena, go to the scale, take them out the back door, and then say goodbye, go home. We'll mail you your check if you win. Uh, so we're not congregating at all in that area. Um, in those permissions, um, I've also asked for the use of the two municipal parking lots in that four corner area. Um, we've asked for permission for the use of the Plex parking lot on Sunday for the rolling car show for staging that. I would like to add to that request and just verbally, I will put it in writing. Um, after talking to many car show people, we thought it, it wise as a contingency plan to ask for the use of the Southampton Coliseum Park parking lot, just in case. Um, all of these uh, car show people have to pre-register. So we'll have a very good handle on, on how many we have. We'll also be able to email them quickly and say your starting point is now Southampton Coliseum and you'll be doing the North route. Um, so I'm hoping that meets with your approval. I did give um, my, my town partners there a heads up that I would be asking that as well tonight. And then you'll see we have asked for some of the usual things we always ask for uh, on the, the next page of that document, which is the road closures, um, the, uh, the commercial dumpster for the veggies, uh, barricades, and help from uh, the lovely town staff in getting this all done. So um, I, I, I guess we can go to the next slide, Tracy. And thank you very much for your consideration. And are there any questions or comments? Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Joanne and John. Uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor and then Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you for your presentation, John and, and uh, uh, Joanne. I just, uh, John, you're, uh, you're you're a little hard on yourself. You know, I've, I've watched you golf, and you're not as not as bad. As, <laughs> not, you're, you're not you're not as bad as what you say you are. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you, uh, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, thank you for your presentation, and, and and congratulations on your vice presidency as well, John. You're. You just keep on giving. I know you're very involved with the Tourist Association over the years, and uh, you're, you're a fine community member, and we appreciate all the great work you do for Saugeen Shores, no question about it. Um, I'm sure that there'll be good cooperation from town staff. There has been over the years, and I'm sure it'll, it'll uh, continue, uh, pending results of council's wishes tonight here, of course. But um, I'm just, and, and I think you're, uh, you're, you're, the creative approach you're taking is, is quite remarkable. So I just want to thank you both, and to your to the pumpkin, pumpkin Pest Committee for all the great work you're doing. Um, when you say about October 3rd and uh, the Cinderella carriage and Sunday, the, uh, or pardon me, on the Saturday, the way off, and then the Cinderella carriage on the Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, um, you say no public attendance is encouraged or expected. Are you talking um, particularly when you say no public attendance? Is that what you're, are you speaking about the Saturday, the way off? Like I, I mean the ruling car show, obviously they're, they're you know, they won't be walking by, standing beside cars because it's a rolling. Uh, but you're talking about, when you talk about no public attendance, are you referring to the Saturday way off, Joanne? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I, there's no public invited. 
Um, we know they're going to see all those vehicles. Mm -hmm. We have planned for that, um, that we will keep people moving should they want to take pictures of the, uh, of the pumpkins on the trucks. But they're not invited inside the arena. Um, the heavy equipment areas will be completely closed off so that no public is allowed in there. Um, and unfortunately, that's, you know, we know people will come and look. We're not encouraging it. Um, so from a masking standpoint, Joanne, just a follow up, you know, I, I assume that everyone in the way station, that everyone have their masks on, correct? And yep. the people that do show up and they're not really encouraged to show up, but you're saying they'll be inquisitive and they'll be, uh, you know, anxious to see what's happening and you're probably just, you'll, you'll see people show up. Um, if they get close, I guess, again, enforcing the mask, how, how will that how will that unfold? How will we'll that have unfold? signs uh, in that whole closed area, Mike. There will be signs posted that you must wear a mask. Um, should, you know, mom and dad, mom and dad get a coffee at Tim Hortons, we will be fencing off that area. They could look through the fence. They can't come in. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, if you look over the, um, the, what's it called? The pumpkin planning thing, you'll see there's maps of closed areas. I do have security within those areas and barricades within those areas as well. And our growers okay. and oh, and the growers have to wear masks. Great. And yeah. So the people that show up from an admission standpoint, uh, will there be much money exchanging hands then, Joanne? No. No, there's uh, there's no admission, no gates. Great. Not, okay. Nothing like that. So no, 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 uh, that's that's fine. And that's I just want to again thank you for all the great work you people do and uh, and and all the best. Thank you. We got Councillor Grace and then Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, John and Joanne, thank you. Um, I just wanna really congratulate you on putting together a great program um, that's exciting. And, uh, you know, I think that um, it's, as uh, the deputy, vice deputy mayor said, is very creative and uh, it would have been easy to sort of just say, well, we're just canceling this year, but you didn't do that. Yeah. And, uh, it was thought uh, about. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. And it would have been, you know, quite understandable, but I, I just think it's fantastic that you're going ahead with it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Councilor Smith. Thank you, and uh, much the same as the comments that have been expressed, I just want to extend my congratulations on the efforts that you, you and your team have put forward, Joanne and John. Uh, I'm no stranger to the uh, the efforts that you guys have gone through. I've, I've been a part of the festival since my early childhood, and it would be uh, a sad October without a pumpkin fest. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge I attended the AMO conference last week and had an opportunity to present a delegation to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries, uh, Lisa, Minister Lisa McLeod. Uh, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that the ministry has continued to support this festival and many others uh, throughout this pandemic, despite the changes. Uh, and I know that other businesses may be looking to support you in creative ways as well. Uh, it's been well stated that festivals, I think it's for every dollar invested in a festival, there's a $1.5 return. Uh, I know we'll be stretched to, to figure out the ways in which our economy can uh, can rebound from, from this festival in particular, but I know you guys will do your best to support local businesses. And if there's ways that local businesses can support you, perhaps you can uh, give us, this is your opportunity to give a plug for how local businesses can continue to support you. Wow, okay, well, thank you, Jamie. Um, with the uh, live production, we have an opportunity to do um, advertising. We do have sponsor spotlights available. That, uh, that sponsors could purchase at a minimal price. We, we just want to break even this year if we can possibly do it. Um, and uh, certainly any support, uh, food, gift certificates, there's things we can give out as prizes for our decorating contest. And also I've got to give a, a hoorah to our corporate sponsors who have come back on board and understand what we're trying to do. Okay, I think I saw uh, Councillor Mayat.
Oh, he's muted. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm still here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Can't see you, but we can hear you. There you go. Ah, there you are. All right. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, just uh, thanks, Joanne. Thanks, John. Uh, reply to John. Yes, the uh, the car enthusiasts of the area are, will be uh, out in spades, I'm sure. Um, I, uh, I didn't wear my pumpkin fest shirt, but I wore my Barracuda shirt here tonight <laughs> to demonstrate that my car will be ready. And uh, and uh, we're, we're getting used to the, the car clubs are getting used to these uh, rolling car shows and there's been a tremendous uh, response. Um, the uh, traditional MC for your pumpkin fest, Dave Middleton has done a great job organizing a couple of rolling car shows. And, uh, and there's been a tremendous turnout for those and, and the public who sit at the end of their farm lanes or on their front lawns or on their porches and, and cheer and wave, it's, uh, it really feels good. And I think it's a, a novel idea. And if we can turn that into a better fundraising, it would be even better. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what is traditionally my last cruise of the year, which is Pumpkin Fest before I put the car away. So carry on the good work and uh, we'll see you at Pumpkin Fest. Thank you, Dave. I should mention Dave Middleton will still be our MC uh, at the way off. We wouldn't do it without him. <laughs> That's right. Are there any other uh, questions from members? I'll say, well, thanks very much, uh, Joanne and uh, John. It's uh, going to be a great event. It's always a great event, and it's still going to be a great event in 2020. A little different, but uh, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to being there. Well, I will actually be weighing pumpkins, but I guess to everyone else, it will be virtual. And yeah, yeah, yes, you will be weighing pumpkins. Yes. You, yeah, you will be there. You will be, I'll there. be there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, the other, the only one thing I would ask, and I, this is just to put it out there, maybe to the Director of Infrastructure and Development as well, that you're talking about not closing 21. Uh, and I just wonder if it's a good idea to entirely give up that road closure, uh, even for a year, I know the MTO is interested in poaching those road closures and um, but we should make sure even if we don't request it of the MTO, we should make sure to advise them that it's just for one year and that we still want that road closure uh, because I know we struggled last year with the Santa Claus parade, Port Elgin didn't put it on and then they wouldn't close the road uh, and I do not want to lose that road closure in years to come. So. Uh, is that something that we can stick handle, Amanda? I see you've come on. Yeah, we did discuss that with the town. Good. And I do believe um, a letter is being crafted by somebody to let MTO know it's a one-time thing. So they, we did discuss that. So Good. All right. That's yeah. Thanks. Very good. good stuff. All right. Thank you guys very much. Have a good night. We'll talk to you guys later. All right. Move this on in our agenda to uh, reports of municipal officers and committees and 7.3 infrastructure and development. And the first one is a staff report on the removal of the holding provision for Saugeen Golf Club and the Director of Infrastructure and Development. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we propose to remove the holding provision on these lots now that we have received the engineer's report saying that servicing with septic and well can be uh, facilitated for the development. All right, we have a recommendation that council pass a bylaw to lift the holding provision on Saugeen Golf Club lands. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? I don't, oh, Councilor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, in the background, it says the subject lands are zoned to permit the construction of a single detached dwelling. I'm assuming you mean per lot. That is correct. Okay, if there's nothing further, then I will ask all in favor. That is carried. Okay, that moves on to the second one, which is a staff report on the waste management master plan. We have a presentation by Ma Matthew Nelson of GM Blue Plan Engineering Incorporated, but we'll turn it over to the director to kick things off. Sure, thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Over the past year, we've been working with Matt and Andrea Nelson on a review of how we manage waste in our community. Uh, it's going to help us determine what to do with the next steps as we end or come close to the end of the life of the landfill. GM Blue Plan is very familiar with our site as they provide monitoring and reporting for us on our behalf every year to the ministry. Uh, I would like to thank them as, long, or as well as Colin, uh, Fiona, Kathleen, and Greg for all the valuable input 
and ideas um, and discussions that they've had over the last year putting together this plan. And with that, I'll turn it over the presentation to Matt. Uh, thank you, councillors and mayor. Uh, I'm just going to put the uh, presentation up here. Can everyone see the, the screen? Not yet. Oh, okay. Let me get back here. There you go. There we go. Okay. Well, just like all consultants, we have way more slides than we do have time. So I'll try and uh, be as brief as I can. Uh, uh, and present mostly the key points. I will, uh, hopefully you will have some time to go through the report where the bulk of the information is. So I'll go through, talk about the purpose, uh, provincial policy and policy that forms the framework for your, your uh, waste uh, diversion and disposal. Uh, look at the current system so we uh, can evaluate where to go. Uh, then we'll break it out basically into diversion. So we separate out diversion options and then we'll look at residual waste management. So the waste that actually goes to the landfill. So setting out to do this waste management plan, we wanted to provide a holistic approach uh, looking at both diversion and residual waste short and long-term planning. So a comprehensive plan that uh, the town could use moving forward. So the policy that drives the, uh, your uh, waste disposal setting and diversion setting is obviously set by the province. Um, unfortunately, while they give uh, some, some policy, they actually provide generally very, very little direction from the province and it's left up to the municipalities or, or uh, in cases where the counties have taken over to actually manage their waste disposal and diversion programs. Uh, provincial policies are in place, as you know, for blue box materials, waste uh, electr uh, electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, they have policies for composting, uh, municipal hazardous and special waste. Uh, and use tires. The town uh, has also their own initiatives for diversion, including scrap metal, mattresses, fluorescent bulbs, film plastics, and your uh, hazardous waste program is operated by the county. So Bruce County runs that for all the municipalities. We're at a very dynamic time in especially uh, blue box uh, and waste diversion based on the switch to uh, the uh, extended producer responsibility program by the province that came in uh, under the Waste Free Ontario Act in 2016. The biggest difference in, is that instead of uh, setting up stewardship uh, programs, they actually put the cost of recycling and collection onto the producers. The details of this program unfortunately aren't uh, in place yet. They're being developed right now. Um, we expect to see them out in about a year or two. And so uh, like a lot of things, um, it's the devils in the details. So uh, that unfortunately, that part of this uh, uh, waste plan won't be, wouldn't be able to be finalized at this time, but it's uh, the core programs and the core information would be the same. Um, also with the blue box, with the Waste Free Ontario um, Act is uh, the plans to start um, imposing or banning food wastes uh, from disposal. Uh, like most other green waste or uh, programs, that's expected to be rolled out based on population size. So similar to their historic uh, programs with composting. So in order to know where you're going, obviously we have to know where we are. So uh, the report spends a lot of time looking at your current system, diversion, waste disposal. Uh, I'll try and summarize it briefly here. Uh, 
Um, but um, again, I refer you to the report for the bulk of the information. Uh, important to establishing programs for your your waste program is knowing obviously your population and uh, population density. So uh, we all know a couple major um, sort of urbanized areas, but otherwise a large, relatively large uh, rural or rural uh, urban setting. The waste generation sources uh, are um, typically about 60% um, residential and then 16% uh, from ICNI. So that's industrial, commercial and institutional and included in ICI. We've also in your particular case have a large tourism component. You'll see this term residential and ICNI come up a lot throughout the report. And that's because of the provincial policy framework and the way they've set that out. Um, typically, the, the, the only uh, forced responsibility on the municipalities is for residential waste. Uh, ICNI in some areas are, are completely private, dealt with privately. In smaller rural municipalities, particularly Gray and Bruce counties, they get lumped in uh, just because of uh, the, the availability of uh, resources for them, as well as the, the uh, combined support from the municipality for those area businesses. They're typically smaller, smaller um, businesses. So we talk about a lot of data in the report. We've used uh, the Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority. That's the former Waste Diversion Ontario. They compile all the numbers uh, for different municipalities in terms of what's reported and for diversion and waste. We also use the town's records from the waste scales and volumetric surveys. So topographic surveys that we do on a regular basis and compare the volumes. And then also we have uh, member uh, agencies or support such as uh, Basra and the County of Bruce for the municipal hazardous waste. So Saugeen Shores right now is disposing of about, uh, I mean, had, generates a total waste of about 10,000 uh, metric tons or tones. Uh, again, of that about 62% is residual waste and about 38% is diverted. The diverted includes all, um, all sorts of components that um, blue box, green waste, and I'll break those down in future slides. So you can see we also have the components uh, based on uh, the documentation estimates of ICNI versus residential that are going into the landfill or being diverted from the landfill. Uh, we'll talk a lot about uh, these diversion parameters uh, and what, uh, when you see organic waste, you'll see here, that's a large number. I'll get into that. That includes all the leaf and brush. So this is uh, not to deceive you, it, you'll, you'll see it come up. It, it's in rural municipalities, very high. It's, it's, it's the way the reporting's done. It's mostly again, leaf, brush, and all that yard waste that's delivered to the site. So it gets included in diversion, but uh, we'll get into some of the, the real numbers for disposal and, and diversion. So again, once we look at um, the residential sector here, you'll see that for Saugeen Shores, your residential diversion is about 47%. Uh, the blue box uh, and uh, off, off property organics uh, are the primary diversion components. So the residual waste is about 54%. So that's diversion rate is, is fairly good, but I'm just asterisk uh, that off property. So when we focus in on just the diverted materials, uh, you can see here how important the blue box program is right now. Again, we have changes coming up with extended producer responsibility that might uh, enhance that. Um, off property includes again the leaf and um, leaf and yard waste and the on property organics is uh, a, a calculation that's done based on the number of, of properties 
and uh, composters you sell that sort of thing. Some of these small pies don't look big, but are, are obviously very critical to achieving your diversion. Things like household hazardous waste, obviously not a large uh, volume or mass per se, but really important for environmental security. Uh, same with the electronics. Uh, scrap metals, a great um, uh, program for, uh, and actually is, is, uh, has value. So it actually also brings revenue in. Um, when we talk about percentages, uh, we have to be careful because really it, most important is getting your total waste down. So it, it's easy to talk about percentages a lot, but the important numbers is what is actually going into your landfill in terms of mass, total mass per capita, and then uh, how much diversion is occurring. And obviously the best thing to do is to reduce your actual waste production. And then from there, you can start increasing your diversion. So we look at, on the left side, you'll see um, the residual waste on a kilogram per capita. And you'll see town of Saugeen Shores compared to the provincial average. So that provincial average includes all the, all the cities, urban areas, and then a more rural type municipality that has good uh, information that we often use as a benchmark. County of Dufferin is around 180 uh, and, and Saugeen Shores is around 251. Um, now, when we look at diversion, you'll see uh, when you pull out blue box in terms of per capita, the per capita compared to provincial average in Dufferin again is a little bit low, um, 72%. Uh, so we, we think it's quite reasonable that Saugeen Shores should be getting up towards the provincial average. So sticking with diversion, we'll start talking about diversion options. Um, I won't obviously go through this ginormous table and it's probably not in the copy you have. I just wanted really to refer you to a couple tables that are really the meat of the report. So I'll be talking about some of these options underneath, but when you're actually sitting down and you want to evaluate all this information, if you go to table nine, three and 10, one, that would probably summarize enough, a uh, very significant portion of our report. And those are about all the options, what you're gonna get out of it and potential costs associated with those options. So recycling opportunities, uh, residential blue box. And again, just to remind everyone that's, that's what will change with the EPR. The first thing to come out of the changes in the EPR is how the blue box is delivered. Uh, that would be a whole nother talk. So um, in the short term, um, uh, things that uh, we saw as opportunities were uh, cardboard collection service, uh, either within the blue bin or monthly that's um, offered in some other municipalities with success. Uh, enhancement of recycling depots, um, provision of free blue boxes, uh, and uh, one of the key recommendations or opportunities we saw was to adjust the curbside waste collection schedule so that the blue box and the waste were picked up at the same time. Uh, for ICNI sector, uh, particularly because of the tourism uh, industry, uh, the potential for offering large disposal bins or systems to campgrounds or business where uh, needed and the and provide the same under the same vein provide an increased level of service aimed at that tourism industry during the peak season and that's availability really of 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 recycling options for people that are coming through on the short term with respect to organics um, the, the the town is already offering uh, the composters at cost. There has been some recent promotion of green cone di uh, digesters, and that would be applicable here for people that are, uh, are timid or aren't, aren't willing to compost in the backyard due to fears of uh, animals and particularly bears. So the, the feedback from the, the green cone digesters is that they really do reduce odors and reduce uh, vermin. 
with respect to uh, other organics, the only the main opportunity would be just uh, additional collection of leaf and yard, a uh, leaf and yard pickup service. Some municipalities have had success with that. Uh, obviously, that would be most applicable to your urban areas. The uh, green pro, uh, bin program or SSO, source separated organics, which is kitchen waste, that sort of thing, uh, is an is a opportunity, but it, uh, it would give you an opportunity to reduce waste. But uh, you'll see throughout here, our valuation shows that uh, similar to most rural municipalities, it's usually limited due to cost or value. So it has a high cost and, a, and usually a low uh, low value point on it. When we look at, again, waste reuse and reduction, the, the key components of uh, the, the, the most critical components to, to uh, extending your life of your landfill and, and reducing waste, uh, we recommend always maintaining a pay per use or a fee system. There's lots of studies that show when there's a direct correlation to uh, cost that the recycling or diversion is increased. And that uh, is through bag tags typically. We also, uh, you may also want to consider implementation of a bag limit of two bags per week. Uh, other uh, things would be a clear bag policy. And then also the um, tipping and fee schedule also uh, has a tendency to control disposal. Reuse opportunities uh, are, are relatively limited, but all those, again, all of these incremental uh, diversion programs or reuse programs are, are, are supported. Uh, so maintain and promote reuse opportunities by uh, clothing bins. And those are usually done through uh, third party uh, um, uh, not for profit profits or charities. And obviously that's affected by COVID, but uh, that's something in the future. As part of any program, education, promotion and enforcement are always very important and shouldn't be undervalued. Uh, the, uh, we always recommend the, the town website and other web-based media are updated with schedules options uh, th that's been done. Uh, the environmental calendar um, has been a, a good program for Soggy and Shores. Uh, one um, new program that we would uh, recommend is at least an outreach and collaboration with ICNI sector uh, in terms of, in particular, again, the diversion. So uh, a group that could uh, get together with business as and find out um, 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 needs and uh, opportunities there. And lastly, uh, the use of policies and bylaws uh, once the systems are set up uh, can, can further support the programs. So that well, covers most of the diversion uh, information I'll be presenting. And now I'll go on to the landfill sites, so the residual waste. So um, we'll be talking about, again, your current systems and then potential options once your uh, site reaches closure. So right now, your main operating site, obviously, is your Southampton landfill. There's the Port Elgin landfill, which is closed and uh, at capacity. At Southampton, there's about 10 to 12 years remaining based on the growth projections. Any future development uh, at the site beyond 40,000 meters cubed would be subject to an environmental assessment and then an ECA process. Uh, multiple studies, including hydrogeologic and design studies would need to be completed to show that future development could occur at the site without causing uh, offsite environmental impacts. In the short term, uh, any landfill is, I like to think of it as backwards mining. So there's, there's a, a large value in the airspace that your current landfills have. And 
the future cost of space is, is quite expensive. So uh, because of all the studies and, and, and regulations for uh, expanding or developing a new site. So uh, one of the best ways obviously to uh, reduce your overall cost is invest in techniques that would reduce your waste disposal volume. So you have improved waste diversion, which we just talked about. And then we, we, we can also uh, include for planning and improved operations. And that those activities can in increase your site life. So some of those operations that would, we think would help uh, your life and also in the short term, but also long term and, and set up your landfill site for potential future changes is the front end improvements. So uh, constructing a, uh, a waste receiving and transfer area that supports diversion and separation of wastes. Um, we'd look at continuing to uh, keep abreast of your site life through surveys and waste monitoring. So waste monitoring the waste going in. And thirdly, the most important, which actually Soggy and Shores has been on top of for a, a quite a while, is landfill compaction. And again, your approval is based on airspace. So obviously, the more waste you can stuff into a cubic meter, the longer your site life. Uh, so just a quick comparison for Soggy and Shores. If you look at this orange line on the left, that looks at a waste compaction density of about 500 kilograms per meter cubed. And the purple line looks at a compaction density of 2034. So uh, that compaction is achieved through, can be achieved through multiple um, things, careful operations in terms of the lifts of waste and the number of runs over it with a, with a packer, which uh, Soggy and Shores has. So they've already invested in the sheep foot uh, packer and then uh, shredding the garbage can also increase um, the ability for it to be compacted. Um, obviously, the compactor was uh, purchased and there's been some operational issues, but uh, we'll go on here to the residual waste management um, options. So as with the version options, I referenced the a main table in the report. This is table 10.1 uh, in that goes through all the different residual waste options and has implications for each. Uh, obviously, I won't go through this whole table. Uh, it would, it's quite a, quite a lot to look at, uh, but I will just briefly talk about some of the key, um, the key options that we've reviewed in the report. Uh, I won't get into the details with capital costing and all that uh, information. Um, directly, but uh, we will get to our final recommendations. So if you do want to review information, I would re refer you to this table. So in the short to medium term, again, we talked about maximizing capacity. So these are the residual waste options and recommendations. Uh, maximize the success of your existing waste diversion and continue to initiate additional waste diversion strategies as they become available. For long-term disposal options, I'll go through about three options here. So we looked at the use of, um, we looked at landfill options. So both the town operated landfill, a shared landfill, and then we looked at also in more innovative technologies. So when we look at the continued use of the existing landfill uh, as a town uh, run uh, system, we found this to be the most secure waste management option. There is no partnerships or reliance on third party. The, however, the landfill expansion would require the completion of the EA process, which we talked about. That's about a five to 10 year process and there is some uncertainty with that process um, but hydrogeologically the the site is in actually a, a relatively good setting the uh, one of the downfalls of this uh, approach is that it doesn't take a, a advantage of the economies of scale 
So with small municipalities, there's usually a lot, a lot of cost to getting the approval, everything up and running, and it's not being used at a very high relative at a very high rate. So where uh, once you get approval, it's usually um, you would have a lot of cost savings because if you had three, four, five municipalities, you'd still only need one sheep's foot packer. You'd have the same set of monitoring wells. You'd still have the same engineering more or less. So that's where the, the, the advantages come in with economies of scale. We also looked at partnerships for a new or expanding landfill. Um, this does get the economies of scale, but uh, there's uncertainties in terms of negotiations with other parties and timing. So um, again, you would have the difficulties in terms of finding partners uh, and negotiations. But if those were to work, uh, it would be, uh, I would consider it cost advantageous. Uh, for other uh, long-term disposal options, thermal and incineration have been grouped together. There's multiple technologies that have been on the rise over the last 10 years. These uh, for smaller municipalities are very limited applicability and that's because of their very high capital and operational costs and they typically require very high volumes of waste to operate. So um, again, being the smaller player at the table would most likely, it would only be applicable if you were probably joining on to an, an exist a system that's been developed by a larger party. Um, the other option which has been used in the area and, and we're all across Ontario is what I lumped together as a third party system for waste disposal. And this is the most certain and feasible. So that's just simply contracting with like a waste management, green for life, whatever, any of those players in terms of uh, they would they would take your waste. Often it's combined with, with collection, but regardless, the, the idea is that that waste would not be disposed of in Saugeen Shores, it would be shipped to a third party landfill. The, the biggest downfall of this obviously is the least control with waste acceptance and cost. So uh, long-term cost of that disposal is, is all controlled by uh, market and, 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 um, and availability. Uh, just a note here, that's has been used by many landfills sort of as a short term or interim solution where where they're transitioning. So it's it's always a, a good tool in your back pocket. So uh, just to keep things moving, uh, the summary of recommendations in our report, again, are all provided in tabular form, but uh, annually, these are things that are going on, but important to do. Review and evaluate your diversion programs. Explore additional waste diversion options and incentive programs. I know that's done uh, every year, but it's important to keep that up, especially with the changing environment. Keep promotional materials and educational programs up to date and keep the, the, the staff uh, trained. In the short term, we recommend implement, implementing the equivalent curbside pickup service, so same timing of blue box and garbage. Maintain a uh, paper use, a bag tag system and a bag limit uh, and add a bag limit. Update the tipping fee schedule. Uh, consider the implementation of a clear bag and uh, continue to explore and promote reuse opportunities and uh, most importantly, uh, for the tourism and uh, sector is look at, at that outreach uh, program to improve the ICNI waste diversion. In the long term, we would uh, recommend um, evaluating the source separated organics as the uh, opportunities come in. Uh, I would note uh, that although uh, this waste management report is done for the town, there is the innovative uh, uh, committee uh, report uh, that Dylan Consultant is doing for a combined, looking at combined options. So uh, along with this report, I know uh, staff will be looking to stay abreast of the findings of that report. And 
that type of report will be talking about shared systems within the municipality. So looking at shared collection and shared things like SSO and uh, shared landfilling. Um, with residual waste, um, again, initiate planning of an improved waste receiving transfer. And then this is uh, critical here. Uh, the town will have to evaluate and uh, decide on which preferred approaches they want to follow. So the way our report set up is a, it's a bit of an a la carte uh, between those big tables I showed you and, and, and it will be up to uh, the town to decide which, which uh, programs they want to follow and how much um, energy and cost they're willing to, to get for each of those programs that are in those tables. But in terms of your long-term residual waste management decisions will have to be made soon because of that five to 10 year planning horizon. And then also the um, uh, 10 to 15 year site life. So th those, are, those are coming together at the same time. Within two years, we'd look at uh, recommending that, that the, the waste receiving and transfer area would be completed and then continue to evaluate your post-closure uh, disposal options. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, again, another big table, but this flow chart really for people who want to see how, what process would come out of, uh, for the municipality come out of a new or expanding landfill would uh, be, and you can see it's a stepwise process, um, and through that process, you can change voluntarily or you might be forced out of a new or expanding landfill if the EA is unsuccessful. So uh, throughout this process, you wouldn't be stuck with a new or expanding landfill. You would continue to look at opportunities as they arise, but um, that would be the path through to getting uh, a town landfill at the expanded landfill at the at the uh, Southampton landfill site. And like any program, uh, there's always monitoring and continual improvement. And we talked a lot about staying abreast of waste diversion, disposal opportunities, monitoring waste disposal will allow, um, allow the town to make uh, informed decisions about how they wanna proceed with some of those diversion programs and what value they're getting from them. So that concludes uh, the, oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> jumping ahead here. So when we look at the, the waste, I just threw up a slide of the waste receiving area here um, in case there's any questions, but uh, this is the kind of schematic of the landfill and the waste receiving area. Again, we can just show it. I'll just glance over it. This is all in the report. So uh, that concludes my presentation and I'll, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thanks, Matt, appreciate uh, your presentation. And uh, I know a number of members of council have submitted questions already that you and Amanda have uh, already addressed. I just want to express appreciation for your having done that as well. And we'll uh, open the floor for other questions from members and we'll start with the Vice Deputy Mayor and then come to Councilor Grace. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, um, Thank you, Matt, for your uh, your presentation and uh, for the document. It's uh, well well put together. I, I did send a, in a fair number of questions to Amanda. I want to thank you too, Amanda, for the quick response today and uh, all the excellent responses. Um, my, my, really, my only other question um, was, um, you know, about the waste receiving transfer area. Um, what what would the, be the disadvantages of not doing that versus the advantages? Um, just the disadvantages I would say are the, uh, potential for reduced diversion. So it's been known that when you have a convenient front end receiving area, it supports diversion. So if you, if the people don't have to wait a long time, if they can drive in smoothly and they have a very clear, drop-off system, it usually increases diversion. So people won't just drive to the waste bin where they're forced to drive through in front of diversion options. 
it it typically increases diversion quite quite dramatically actually okay so in, in terms of longevity i mean that's the end goal is it not to with diversion is so what you're saying is with the, with the station you know receiving station like that transfer station it 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 be designed to try and add a year or two or three at the end that's Here. right yeah exactly and 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 it would it usually is advantageous for adding additional streams when it's laid out nicely and you don't have crossover of traffic and better monitoring and that sort of thing. And I know, man, you can't, it's hard to put the cost wise, but it's got to be a big ticket item, right? It, 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 where this is not a, a small project. Yeah, uh, we have those costs. Um, I'm sorry if I missed that in the report. Yeah, but... I, I, I could, I could send it separately. I don't have it in front of me, oh, but um, we could look at some, it's, it's not, it's surprisingly, it's not like road infrastructure uh, in that, you know, you have very uh, specific design requirements. It's usually constructed more simply. Um, it, it can look fancier, but they're usually simple concrete retaining walls uh, with grading. And then uh, the drop bins are, are lined up typically in a, in a staggered or a sawtooth pattern. So it's, it's not a lot of work typically. Maybe not as expensive as one might think then. Yeah, it's it's not like a, a meter of of, of uh, urban road, that's for sure, yeah. Thanks again for your presentation. To add to that, Vice Deputy Mayor, I just wanna say that we had uh, money in last year's budget and this year's budget for the entrance work. So we'll continue on that process with that those dollars and would we'll bring back to council any overages. Very good. All right, Councilor Grace and then Councilor Rich. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Matt and Amanda. And Colin, I see, is on the call, too. Um, I submitted a number of questions. I am going to ask a few of them uh, just for the benefit of the public. I know that some of them are interested in these answers as well. And then I did have um, a, a question that I submitted late. And so I hope you can maybe um, answer that or at least get back to us on it. Um, regarding the... Um, collection of food waste and the green bin program. I understand that um, individual green bin collection is um, pretty expensive, very expensive at this point. Um, I have had a number of people ask me about it. Um, I wondered, and, and I've already received an answer on this, but I, I wondered if you could speak to the um, possibility of having uh, sort of a a depot. Um, I know that I think it's Jasper, Alberta has a, um, a program where they have neighborhood uh, green bin organic waste, um, like by just food waste, um, neighborhood collection depots that are animal proofed. And um, it seems to be pretty successful from what I've read about. Is, is that just something that's cost too cost prohibitive at this point for the size of our municipality? Yeah, so the, I guess it's a choice if it's cost prohibitive. Yeah, it would be similar in terms of cost. The major, one of the major costs is the shipping and disposal um, and then the, the collection. So it would reduce, uh, the collection is actually, again, like about half or a major component of the, the, the overall cost. So it would reduce the collection a bit. In Ontario, uh, the problem with the green bin containers um, that I foresee uh, would be just the difficulty in our approval framework. So I understand that each of those con depot containers would need an approval. So it would be considered a waste transfer spot. So th then I would also my other concern, and I don't know uh, Jasper's situation as well, is the problem with unpoliced depots. We've typically gone away from that in Bruce and Gray County. There's been a lot of problems with uh, improper disposal, contaminating the loads. So once there's an unpoliced uh, container, uh, there's been a lot of problems with contamination. Uh, and then uh, then we would, uh, I'm not sure about odors uh, and other issues, um, but we could, um, we could look into the Jasper um, 
uh, example in more detail. Well, I appreciate that answer. Thank you. I think that gives um, people who are interested in that some um, more specific reasons why it might not be the best route at this time. I, I'm not sure. Um, with regard, this is really a question for Amanda. I asked you before, but I know many people are really interested and enthusiastic about our film plastics collection program. Could you just uh, update us real quickly on whether we're continuing that as a pilot project? Sure, and, and through, yeah, we did continue that project through 2020 in the budget, um, and we're going to continue to do the same um, as a proposed um, service in 2021, unless directed otherwise. It does get used a lot. They're full, well, we pack them back down, and there hasn't been a time when trash taxis come and there hasn't been any plastic in it. That's great, thank you. Um, my next question is about this clear bag uh, policy with the privacy bag. Um, to me, that implies that there would be some kind of inspection to make sure that what's being put in the bag is appropriate. Uh, is that right? What would be the purpose of that recommendation? I'll, I'll take this one for, for this, Matt, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, right now, we have in our collection contract a restriction to the amount of recyclables that you can put in a garbage bag. So it's sort of based on if the garbage collector can see and tell that there's that many pop cans or glass bottles, then they're allowed to decline taking that garbage away. A clear bag would make it obvious that there is recycling in the garbage. Uh, the privacy bag allows you to have one small, like um, an AMP bag or, or a kitchen size bag of things that you don't want your neighbors to know you're throwing out. Okay, great. Um, my next question is about, uh, actually I a couple of questions about construction waste. Um, in the, um, I guess, first of all, is construction waste classified as the IC&I waste? Uh, yes. So yes, construction waste would get included in IC&I. Uh, typically, if it's dropped off by a contractor or uh, a commercial builder or, or, or a roofer, let's say someone like that. Uh, but uh, if it's a residential drop off, a, a, sort of a weekend, you know, tear down of a shack in your backyard, it would probably be designated as residential yeah, in terms of your paper paperwork and the paperwork at the landfill and maybe Amanda could or Colin could expand. But that's what I recall from from our early review of the data. Yeah, I, I'm asking the question because it seems to me in the last couple of years, we've had reports about why that our landfill is uh, that the capacity is decreasing at a, um, a more significant rate because we, we have so much building going on in our town. And um, so I, I guess what I'm driving towards is what's our success rate in terms of um, diversion of construction waste? I saw that in the report, 7.9% um, of our diverted waste is construction waste, but we do, we know or have an idea of how much of the construction waste is diverted. I, sorry, I don't think we can report on that. I'll maybe I'll reach to Matt and I'm done, but when we do the diversion, we do have the sorted and unsorted data collected. Um, so we, at the end of this year, we'll be able to say how that uh, tripling of the cost for unsorted was successful this year if we see a, a, a decrease in that collection. Um, we have wood and metal and those things separated, but because it's residential and ICI mixed together, I'm not sure of the, the answer on how much we're diverting currently. Okay. Thanks, and, and that was my last question is, is uh, just the, what um, measures are we taking to incentivize um, producers of construction waste to do more diversion and more separating. So it sounds like we're tripling fees, is that right? Uh, three, yes, that's correct. So we have um, unsorted waste is significantly more expensive than sorted material. And when we look at the landfill entrance, that's an opportunity we have there that we can put bins out for wood and for better recycling of that material as well. 
That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rich. Thank you to you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> My question uh, was with regard to uh, waste diversion um, as well and construction waste. So when I look at those numbers and I see the large amount of construction that we've got going on, um, I think that our numbers would be a lot closer to the provincial average with regard to diversion once our boom in construction kind of comes to a halt. I don't think it's really very easy to kind of keep track of that stuff. You get um, bins being brought in by Orange County and different and different companies and construction waste coming through. I don't think that um, it, a lot of that is diverted. Um, I was just gonna mention as far as uh, green bins and um, uh, curbside pickup, um, Concardon was quoted by Basra, I think it was five years ago now um, for an entire green bin program. So I'll get that report to council later on so that you guys can see what the cost um, uh, is for doing that program. Uh, I, I, and it's off the top of my head, I, I couldn't find it today and I'm having Vince uh, give it to me, but I think it was something in the vicinity of $35 a household or something like that. So um, uh, annually. So um, and th those were my only comments. I, but Councillor Grace asked the questions that I had with regard to construction uh, waste diversion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, further comments from members of the committee or questions? Councillor Maya. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and just one, uh, one point I wanted to raise, and I'm not sure if it's a, a, it's not a question, it's just a point of clarification that we, we continually refer to our uh, current uh, waste management facility as the Southampton dump, when in fact it's, uh, it's a couple of kilometers away from Southampton and it's in Saugeen Township. And I think we should, uh, from here point forward, refer to it as the Saugeen Shores landfill facility and not the Southampton dump, even though uh, historically, when we had a, a dump in Saugeen Township that was closer to Port Elgin, we referred to that as the Port Elgin dump and the Southampton dump, so we knew where we were at any given time. But um, I think uh, for clarification, it is the Saugeen Shores dump located in Saugeen Township, the grass fastest growing sector of our, our municipality. Thank you. These Saugeen Township guys, they claim ownership over everything, okay? Eh? All right, is there uh, any, uh, any other questions or comments from members of the committee? I just uh, have a couple of uh, um, things. First, I guess, well, first, thank you very much for all of your work, uh, uh, Matt, and uh, to staff, uh, Amanda and Colin and your team. Uh, this is a really comprehensive report and one that uh, we badly need because this is a very important facility for our community. The community, as everyone knows, is growing very quickly. Uh, the construction is one thing, but of course there's the population that comes behind that and they are going to need uh, a landfill site that's going to last for a very long time and we have to ensure there is one, which, uh, which is why, uh, in my view, um, the one clear thing that comes out of this report to me is that we need to start work right away on a fulsome expansion of that landfill site. Um, you know, we have a the, the option here, the Southampton landfill site expansion, I just brought up the detailed part in the report, and there's the option there for the expansion to gain as much as 2 million meters cubed of space in that landfill site, a fix really for a generation or more um, to secure uh, landfill capacity for the community for decades and decades to come. We need to do that. Uh, that has to get done. So I think that uh, we need to start the planning um, right away. Uh, it's a 10 year planning horizon. I'm very glad that Matt, uh, with your expertise, you've been able to sort of give us that definition of how long that process takes. We have a landfill site with 13 or 14 years of life in it and a 10 year planning horizon. So we got to get cracking and get that work going. And, and the other thing we can do, and it's, it was interesting, very interesting for me to read the information about some of the um, more some of the short-term things we can do to get more space there, pick up 40,000 cubic meters here and there just by changing the contours and, and whatnot. And I think we need to work on the plan for that to try to drag out three or four more years of life on the far end so that we have the time in that plan. So we make sure, uh, get the insurance policy in place if you like to make sure we get that planning done to get that landfill expansion completed, get the approvals in place because uh, it could take longer than 10 years so we have to get at it so for me that's that's uh, lesson number one and priority number one obviously the diversion uh, elements are important and we need to 
we need to do those things, many of those things, not all of them. I can't say I support them all, but I, uh, but I do support a number of them. And I think that we should, uh, we should have that discussion at council and get some of those things rolling and get the diversion in hand so that we can pick up that space as well and that extra time. So we need to work on that. And that brings me to my final point, which is how we pay for all of that, because uh, as uh, Matt put up on the screen uh, with his chart there, there was quite a few of those diversion efforts come with cost. All of them come with a cost and we need to, we need to give some serious thought, I think, to how we pay and how our system of paying for the for landfill is working. I've talked about this before. Um, all we have for paying for landfill at this point is fixed fees. We have what is essentially a fixed bag tag and we have a fixed fee on the taxes and fixed fees don't do a very good job of paying for things because the cost of doing things increases over time. Uh, so we need a solution that gives us an, a funding source that grows with inflation. Uh, and I think uh, reconsideration of how, as I've said before, how that bag tag fixed fee system works uh, needs to be done. I think that, uh, you know, uh, Matt raises, and I understand the, the experience that uh, he draws on uh, that the, the pay uh, per use model works. I mean, I think it's important to recognize and you've used it, they've used the term quite a few times in the report, Matt, about a full pay-per-use system. We don't have one of those. Uh, ours is very much a partial pay-per-use system. And, and that part that it's you that the, we're paying for per use is diminishing every year because we never increase the price of bag tags. Uh, so, uh, so we don't have a full system and we have, we have a hybrid. And I think tinkering with that hybrid a little bit could um, on one hand, give us a, a, a steady funding source, and on the other hand, provide some disincentive to overusing the landfill. Uh, as I've said, I think that we should eliminate bag tags on the first bag of garbage, and then we should dramatically increase the right the price of bag tags, so that those later bags, if you want to buy, you don't need to put a bag limit on. What you need to do is is get the price of bag tags up so high that putting out subsequent bags, there's a serious disincentive to that. Two dollars is no disincentive. It needs to be a lot more than that. Uh, so I think um, we should do that, and we should uh, take the we should put the money that uh, that we lose on that and raise it through the fixed fee, and then we should peg the fixed fee to inflation, so that we never fall behind again in terms of paying for these things. Um, I think we need to we need to look at that model and fix it so that we can uh, have a sustainable system that gets these things done that we need to do and secure this facility for the long term and secure our collection system for the long term. Um, so you've given us a lot of good things to think about here, Matt, and uh, a lot of good detail and a pretty good synopsis of the whole environment uh, when it comes to waste management. And, uh, and I certainly appreciate that very much. I'm gonna, I've read your report uh, and I'm gonna read it again because uh, it's, uh, there's so much to it. And I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's something we need to absorb because it's uh, it's uh, good information to have. So thank you very much for uh, for all you've done and appreciate it. So if there's uh, nothing further than I have, a second here, I have a recommendation that council receives the long-term waste management plan prepared by GM Blue Plan Engineering Incorporated, dated August 2020. Is there any further discussion of the recommendation? I don't see any, so I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. Okay, thank you. So that moves on to the third item, a staff report on Bruce Area Solid Waste Recycling, Garbage Collection Contract, and the Director. Thank you and, and through you. And uh, one last time, I'll just thank Matt and tell him you're free to go if you'd like, but you're more than welcome to stay and, and watch the rest of the riveting uh, uh, council as well. So we'd like to uh, renew the garbage collection contract with Basra for another five years. The town is a partial owner in Basra with other municipalities sitting on the board of directors. And over the past five years, we've received good service from Basra with the collection service. Um, so at this time, we propose to extend it, uh, continue the same level of service that we've had for the five years with the uh, same um, sense that is a good value for the price. 
Okay, we'll have a recommendation. We'll read it. Then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that council pass a bylaw to authorize the five-year agreement for the municipal solid waste collection services with Bruce Area Solid Waste Recycling. Uh, questions or comments from members of the committee? Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Amanda, um, if you could just um, speak about how difficult it would be to open up the agreement um, if we do end up making um, changes based on short-term recommendations um, to the waste uh, collection schedule or whatever we, we end up doing. Thank you, and, and through you, Mr. Mayor. There's a couple items in there that uh, Matt touched on, which are the collection being the same week as garbage and for recycling. Those are two that we're not at this time staff proposing to go forward on because of the short-term rental um, situation. It's hard for that to be every two weeks for garbage collection. Plus we know that Basra does not have the capacity to do recycling in our municipality for every week. So I think it would be difficult to implement. I also would like to see more of what the province is gonna do with the producer pay system before changing too much on the blue box and what the MIC report comes out with. We had a meeting last week with the group that uh, Dylan Consulting is working with. And uh, so if there's more changes countywide, I think we're five years away from seeing those changes. Even the producer pay, that's the same time frame that we'll see that solution be put in together. Um, that being said though, because we're sit on the board of Basra, if something is important enough to council that we bring it forward, we would go and negotiate with them and, and we have representatives sitting on that board and I'm sure what's good for Soggy and Shores would be good for the other owners as well and it would be looked at fairly. Okay, are there further uh, questions uh, or comments from members? I don't see any, so you've heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. Okay, thank you, Amanda. That moves us then on to 7.7. .7. There's uh, communications for information there, and a couple of them. There's the one um, there on the Weather Radio Canada letter, and I know there was some interest from some members of council about that, and I just um, I um, wanted to point out that uh, this question has been referred to the senior management team just in the last few days. Uh, and so I know they will uh, um, have a look at this and what the implications of uh, the decommissioning of this uh, service or the, the discontinuation, I guess, of this service uh, will have on our community. And if uh, there are, um, uh, if there is any action that uh, we think we need to take as a municipality, I know they'll come back to council and uh, talk to, about that with us. Uh, so. Um, so we can look forward to, to uh, hearing from staff about it. Is there any other comments on uh, petitions for information? Councilor Carr. There we go. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm just curious when it comes to the range light, I'm just curious. I'm not sure. Oh, that's, the, Matt, that's the next, that's on reported department head. Sorry. Right. I'm just sorry. I'll save it for that one. You're probably you're probably going to just start talking right away because I don't think there was much else on any of the information. So I will move to the reports from department heads. And I'll just ask quickly if the director has any. Do you want to make any comments, uh, Jane, about the range light uh, um, report? Uh, no, thank you. And through you, I really didn't have a lot to include in it, but I really wanted to be sure that the um, councillors were aware of the key messaging that I wanted to share with you. And that was the partnership with Marine Heritage. They're enthusiastic to start a fundraising campaign and we'll work with them closely and secure um, um, future costs for phase two that will be discussed through budget deliberations. Okay, Councillor Carr, sorry about that. No, no, so no problem. Sorry about the, the wrong timing there. Uh, Jane, I guess towards you, I've just, I, I've had a few people contact me in regards now through this report. Most of it, from what I understand, there is more cosmetic damage than structural damage at this time with it. Uh, but from what I understand, maybe I'm incorrect at this time, but that range light is not operational at this time, is it? Uh, the light is operational at this time, it is, and uh, I remind councillors that um, DFO, uh, the Coast Guard, maintains the light within the building and we maintain the building. Okay, okay, that's good. That's all I need to know. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gray. Uh, thank you, Jane, uh, for the report and the update. I know many people are really interested and concerned about um, the status of, of this um, 
wonderful icon that we have in our community, um, as well as thanking the Marine Heritage for the leadership um, that they're going to take on this in fundraising. I also want to um, thank Derek Seaman uh, for um, volunteering his uh, labor uh, free of, of charge to the community. And um, that's a, a wonderful um, action on his part. So thanks to Derek. Agreed. I had the opportunity this afternoon to thank Mr. Seaman in person uh, and say that he's a great uh, service he's doing for the community. I appreciate it. Councilor Schreier. Uh, thank you. And through you, um, Jane, thanks for the update and the report as well. And maybe um, this along with uh, some of the, the trail work along the North Shore Road as well. Um, it's easy enough, I think, for us to track some of the repairs um, that we have to make and rehabilitation that we have to make because of the high water level. Do we know if there's any funding right now or potentially that there would be funding coming down the pipe that that we could um, apply for because of the high water and some of the damage. And it's across every municipality right now, but um, I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. So more specifically for the North Shore Trail is what we are looking at. And we are investigating the community resilience program that's just been launched. We participated, uh, three directors today, we participated in a webinar to, gar to garner more information for it. There's still not an awful lot out there. The application form has not been released but we have sent some inquiries to the ministry uh, to at least so we can start to look at uh, some of those programs. We did have, we have asked preliminary if the notion of the North Shore Trail would be a good candidate and we have been told it probably would be. So that's been our focus to date is the North Shore Trail. Perfect, I think that's great. Maybe uh, we could just track internally at some point just uh, any of the repair work or any capital projects that are due to the high water level and some of that damage. So thanks, Jane. Good. Anything further on that one? I don't see anything, so thanks for that. Now there are two uh, other ones there. They were actually uh, prepared by the Director of uh, Protective Services who is uh, away this week. Uh, but um, we have the two ones. I will speak uh, just briefly to the second one as uh, in my capacity as chairman of the emergency control group. Um, the, um, I think uh, the uh, bottom, the basic message here is that uh, we will be uh, considering uh, the declaration of emergency at council later in September uh, and uh, deciding at that time uh, whether or not uh, it's uh, appropriate to continue with it. I think it is appropriate to continue with it for the next few weeks. Um, and most municipalities, in fact, all that I'm aware of are in the region are doing that. Uh, but, um, but it's my view that uh, a declaration of emergency cannot and should not just carry on forever. Uh, and uh, and so I think um, and I think it's the most appropriate for council. I will accept uh, councils. Though I though it's my responsibility to end or to declare an emergency, I think I, I will accept council's uh, direction on how to proceed. To, with that later in September. Uh, and it's also, I think, just worth noting at this time uh, that uh, for the public's information that the municipality is still in a declared state of emergency. Uh, and there is good reason for that. Um, and uh, that uh, for the next several weeks, it's important that everybody uh, do those things uh, that they, that we have been doing all along to keep the community safe and remind yourself that uh, you know there is still an emergency situation happening and it's important that we uh, behave uh, accordingly. So there's that one, and then uh, there's, uh, our, sorry, are there any questions about that? Sorry, the Vice Deputy Mayor? I'm sorry, it's on the next one, Mr. Mayor. Sure, okay, so the next one is uh, on the Victoria Order of Nurses, and again, that's presented by the Director, but if there are questions, I'm sure we can, uh, we can. Uh, well, I, I think uh, Linda or, or somebody online or, or even I can help to try to address them. The Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Mary, just, it's just really a comment, and I just had a good chat with Phil Eggs on our, our Director of Protective Services, and, you know, having a second uh, nurse practitioner uh, coming into Saugeen Shores via the VON is, is nothing short of being great news for our community with 1,800 patients on the orphan patient list, um, you know, and, 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 and a second nurse practitioner having the ability to, you know, take four, five, six hundred patients off that list is really good news for our community, and you know, I know they're not uh, beginning the recruitment process to late, late until late fall, but you know, hopefully by the end of the year, uh, there'll be a second nurse practitioner uh, in, in our medical clinic. And uh, to those people that um, you know are without a doctor right now, uh, I, I've said in the past, I'll say it again: uh, one orphan patient is one too many. 
And uh, our objective always is and will be, uh, you know, to get it down to zero. And uh, hopefully with the second uh, nurse practitioner and maybe a new doctor at some point, an additional, uh, we can get that down to zero. And uh, Jamie may want to add more to this too, but Councillor Smith, but I just, I, it's just a good news story. And uh, when I read it, um, I got on the phone to Phil and had a nice chat with him about it, but he's, he's done some good work here. And, uh, you know, this came to council not long ago and it, it, it kind of got, you know, it was derailed, but uh, now it's back on the tr on track again. So it's just a good news story. And those people without a doctor uh, with Healthcare Connect, um, make sure you register and call that 1-800 number. I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but, you know, get, get registered. And, uh, and, and if, you, if you've been on for a year or two or three, call back say, hey, uh, you still got my name on the list? Yeah, because, you know, I say uh, 1,800 patients on the open patient list is too many. So uh, it's a good news story, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you. Councilor Smith. Thank you. And much like uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor, uh, I commend the efforts of, uh, of our team to pursue this. This is uh, something that uh, I think, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor, your words were halted over the course of COVID-19 as uh, most of the medical profession were directing their efforts elsewhere uh, and not necessarily in contract negotiations. So we're really happy to report that this is back on track. And, and though uh, there is mention of uh, no financial impact, I think we can all agree that when we get the final negotiations, we will see a financial impact. And we do recognize that uh, there is a subsidy involved with this. Um, and, and it is in the interest of the community that we are investing funds to pursue uh, physicians and or uh, accessible health care to our community members. So uh, kudos to the team that was involved in pulling this off and continuing to pursue uh, having health care available to our constituents. Um, we are still and we continue to pursue having physicians in the community. Uh, those efforts have not faulted, though certainly there are a lot of obstacles in the way. Uh, given the, the COVID-19 impacts to not only the medical profession, but also the, uh, the education system that, that perpetuates uh, physicians coming into the community. So we'll continue to work hard and uh, foster interest in having physicians join our community to decrease that list. As you've mentioned, Vice Deputy Mayor, uh, we would ultimately love to see a time where we do not have anyone on the wait list looking for a doctor. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's nothing for I just to add that uh, this really is due to the work specifically, a lot of work by the CAO and by Phil Eagleson uh, on this particular file to bring this over the finish line. It's been a very difficult process, an extended process, and uh, so we're very pleased to see it completed. Looking forward to see these nurses uh, operating in our community. So uh, that's for your information, and thank you very much. And I guess, uh, uh, are there uh, announcements by members, the Deputy Mayor? Nothing this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. Mayor. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Yes, I had an, uh, an opportunity to attend the AMO conference virtually this year. Uh, as many members may recall, a number of us were in Ottawa this time last year, attending the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference. Uh, this year was a little bit different, but I did have the fortune, good fortune of attending a delegation with uh, Minister McLeod, the Minister of Sport, Tourism and Cultural, in Culture rather. Uh, I had an opportunity to display to her the wonders that are Sogging Shores and uh, extend an invitation to her and her ministry. Uh, behold, she had just visited to, uh, to provide us with some funding for both the, uh, the Cultural Center in Southampton and Pumpkin Fest, who we've mentioned earlier. So uh, it was great for her to have recognition of our community. And uh, we look to her and her ministry for guidance on how to further perpetuate tourism in Ontario and the um, travel in your own backyard concept and how we'll be looking to the province to continue to perpetuate those uh, those models throughout Ontario and beyond. So it was a great experience and I thank the ministry and the uh, AMO for putting on a great virtual conference. Thank you for that update. Councillor Schreiner. Uh, nothing tonight, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Rich. Nothing this evening, thank you. Councillor Grace. Nothing this evening, thanks. Councillor Carr. 
Uh, nothing this evening. Just a quick shout out. Don't forget to support local businesses. Keep it local, everybody. You bet. Councillor Maya. Uh, just, yeah, just one thing, just to uh, <clears throat> a very nonpartisan congratulations to my good friend, Aaron O'Toole, on being elected to the, or, or appointed to the leadership of the Federal Conservative Party of Canada. So. And there's, there's a Senate seat waiting for Dave Mayet one of these days. <laughs> the, uh, all right, thank you uh, very much, everybody. I have nothing to report either this evening, so uh, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Smith, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All favor? We stand adjourned and we will reconvene at 20 after the hour. Okay, I'll call the order this regular council meeting. Welcome back, everyone. The second item on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if they have one of those they'd like to declare. Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. Uh, additions, deletions, or amendments. We do have one proposed addition, and it's in the form of a resolution. And I'll ask for mover and seconder that the council agenda be amended by adding agenda item 10, being a close to public session to discuss matters in accordance with bylaw 63, 2015, section 3.8.2B, regarding personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, for the purpose of discussing the appointment of an interim chief administrative officer. This is a continuation of council's discussion held earlier this evening. Is there a mover and seconder to the resolution moved by Carr, seconded by Rich? All in favor? That's carried. Okay, so then that moves us on to, uh, we have no public meeting, moves on to adoption of the minutes. And uh, we have two sets of minutes, the regular council minutes of August 10th, 2020, and the committee of the whole minutes of August 10th, 2020. And I have a resolution that council adopt the minutes of the council meeting of August 10th, 2020, and note and file the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting of August 10th, 2020 as presented. Are there, is there a mover and seconder? Pardon me, Grace? No, is there a mover and seconder? Rich and Schreider? Questions or comments to the resolution, Councillor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question about the um, Committee of the Whole Minutes, um, section 7.7.2 on the South Bruce Peninsula policing proposal. Um, I believe the clerk um, proposed uh, additional wording that should be there that would reflect the um, Councillor Mayette's um, motion and the subsequent discussion and vote. Councillor McClurk. Yes, um, thank you for you, Mr. Mayor. So the minutes have been updated uh, with the wording with respect to the South Bruce Peninsula's request. Um, those minutes were circulated to the members in advance of the meeting, and they've also been attached to the online version of the uh, council agenda. Okay, so that is the set of minutes we're approving here now, correct? Okay. Are there any other questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, then all in favor. That's good. All right, that moves us then on to reports of the Committee of the Whole. And the first one is general government report on the 2019 year end financial report. And there's a resolution that the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopts the general government report dated August 10, 2020, authorizing the transfers to from reserves and reserve from funds as outlined in Appendix C of the CFO Treasurer's Report dated August 10, 2020. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Rich, seconded by Mayette. Questions or comments? Excuse me. All in favor? That's carried. That moves on to the second report, Infrastructure and Development Report, Railway Street Culvert and Affordable Housing Incentives. And I have a resolution that Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopts the Infrastructure and Development Report dated August 10, 2020, regarding the Railway Street Culvert and Affordable Housing Incentives. Is there a mover and second? Moved by Carr, seconded by the Vice Deputy Mayor. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. That moves us then on to the third report, Community Services, Parks and Recreation Report uh, on the reopening of the Centennial Pool. And I have a resolution that Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopts the Community Services, Parks and Recreation Report dated August 10, 2020, regarding the reopening of the Centennial Pool. Is there a mover and seconder for the resolution? Moved by Schreider, second by Rich. Questions or comments to the resolution? Uh, the Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, did council not ask that once the survey is taken, we get a report back to let us know on the numbers of actual uh, potential users before we declare the pool to be open? Looking at the financial statistics. Certainly that was, that was discussed. Uh, is the director there? The director, do you have comments to that? Yeah, certainly. I uh, I did receive um, the feedback from the, the questionnaire as of today, actually, and I can tell you that only 7% um, <clears throat> of those that responded to the questionnaire said they would not respond, they would not attend the pool until a vaccine was established. We had over 345 respondents to the questionnaire. Okay. Are there further uh, questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, then I'll ask all in favor. Carried. Okay, and that moves on to item seven, reports of municipal officers and committees. And the first one is a staff report uh, to, to award of consulting services for Ivings Drive left turn. Uh, the director, uh, do you have any comments before I read the resolution? No? All right, I have a resolution that Council Award R.J. Burnside Limited, the contract for consulting services to prepare the design and contract documents and to provide construction administration for the Ivings Drive left turn advance signal in the amount of $98,065 plus HFD and the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the necessary documents. Are there, is there a mover and seconder? Moved by the Vice Deputy Mayor, second by Grace. Questions or comments? The, uh, we'll get to Councillor Mayan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, and I will be supporting this motion. It's uh, it's certainly uh, it seems to me, and it's unfortunate it seems this way that it seems like we're we're going to spend ninety thousand dollars on an engineering uh, study or a draw, drawings, and and then another potentially four hundred thousand dollars on construction for what I thought would be when I first proposed a left-hand turning lane at Ivan's Drive would be a simple matter of uh, a can of white paint and a new flasher module for the, the light similar to what we have at the other end of town. But it seems um, uh, like many things in, uh, the, in the public realm and, uh, and government, these, uh, these projects become, uh, they take on a life of their own and now we're gonna spend uh, upwards of half a million dollars on uh, a complete rebuild of this intersection, which by the way, is only a three-way intersection. There's no road heading east out of this uh, intersection, unlike the, the other one at the other end of town at Market Street, which is an actual four-way intersection with a simple flasher and a left-hand turn arrow on the street. But it is what it is. And uh, it seems like after six years of, of uh, trying to convince um, the uh, administration that this was something that we should and would go after that it's going to happen and I'm looking forward to the day when traffic flows through that intersection uh, much more easily and efficiently even if it's going to cost a half a million dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further uh, questions or comments uh, to the resolution? The Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, just a quick question. Thank you for your comments uh, Councillor Mayette. I, yeah half million dollars I, I i i all along thought it might be an advanced green for 30 40 50 60 grand but however you're right it is what it is and the question i do have is uh what was the total amount of the uh funding from the province again uh amanda thank you and through you mr maria we had to have it designed by a professional engineer those that understand it and make these things work and so the left turn lane is what the total budget price is. So there's more than just the advanced in this. Um, we submitted to the MTO 492,000 as the total project costs. And we've asked for 442,000 of that to be funded. So we're only looking at 50,000 of our own dollars, 90% funding from MTO. Yeah, so Mr. Mary, just, uh, that's my comment is, you know, there's been some good work done by Mandy here too with, submitting that application and the province has come, come through and it's a good news. We've been talking about this for four or five years now. And I think members of the public are pretty, uh, gonna be pretty happy with the fact that it's gonna be a uh, left-hand turn lane and advanced green, all that sort of. So I, I mean, it's, it's a good news story and uh, it, it, 450 grand 
in funding roughly is um, not going to look a gift horse in the mouth, that's for sure. So thanks, and Amanda, for your good Important to recognize, too, that uh, as, as I recall, we were turned down initially for that funding. And then uh, through uh, the work of our director, uh, that decision was reversed. So. Um, so I think uh, I think uh, the fact that this is proceeding at all in 2020 is uh, a great testament to the work of the administration and particularly the, the director of infrastructure and development. So uh, so we thank you very much for that work, Amanda. So you've uh, heard the resolution. Um, there's nothing further then. All in favor? That's carried. All right, and then so there is a striking committee report there on the CAO recruitment process. Uh, that's there for council's information, uh, on the public's information. Uh, so if there's nothing on that. Then um, we'll move on to the staff report on the confirmation of appointment to the West Ontario Power Board of Directors. And I have a resolution that council. Um, Sorry, there's a word missing here. I think it should be that council authorized the mayor and clerk, no, that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign West Ontario Power Incorporated's special resolution of the shareholders' confirmation of directors. Is there a mover and seconder for that resolution? Moved by uh, Matson, second by Rich. Is there any questions or comments to that resolution? Uh, Councillor Carr. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just curious, uh, with this appointment, is this just a temporary appointment till our CAO position's been redone, or is this something that's gonna be permanently held now? So just to be clear, the resolution we're considering tonight is to approve the appointment of Robert Buckle to replace Bill Getz. Uh, council approved my appointment to the board uh, last meeting, but I will speak to it. I, it's not my intention to remain on the board of West Ontario Power. Um, um, it is my hope that, uh, well, council will be, the best way to look at it is council is going to be reappointing all committees um, as per the schedule at the end of this year. And West Ontario Power's appointment is always made at the same time. So it's my hope that um, when we go to make new appointments uh, early in 2021, that we will also be able to make a new appointment to the Board of West Ontario Power. Okay, thank you. If there's uh, nothing further, uh, then any further re resolution, I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. Okay, so then that moves us on to bylaws. Let me just have a look. There are um, three bylaws on the uh, resolution that we'll consider. We'll separate out the bylaw to confirm the proceedings until after we complete the closed session. So, um, so there's those three bylaws. I'll ask if any member wants to remove any one of those bylaws for individual consideration. Don't see any, so I will read the resolution and we'll look for mover and seconder. It's resolved that the following bylaws are hereby read a first, second, and third time and finally passed and sealed this 24th day of August, 2020. One fifty-five, 2020 being a bylaw to authorize a site plan agreement with Red Hawk Construction Limited. Two fifty-six, 2020 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw number 75, 2006 by the Town of Sogging Shores for lands described as 300 concession, 300 concession Town of Sogging Shores. 357 2020 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw number 75 2006 being the comprehensive zoning bylaw for the town of Sogging Shores for lands lying within the corporate limits of the town of Sogging Shores. Is there a mover and seconder for this resolution? Moved by Grace, seconded by Schreider. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? That's great. Okay, so then we have a resolution uh, that council move into a closed to public session in accordance with bylaw 63 2015 section 3.8.2b regarding personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees to discuss the appointment of an interim chief administrative officer as a remover and seconder for the resolution. Moved by Carr, seconded by uh, Rich. All in favor. That's carried. All right, we'll move into closed session now. And so Linda, what's what, how are we moving into closed session here? So Mr. Mayor, I'd ask that all council members remain on this Zoom meeting. I'd ask that all attendees and participants, including staff members, uh, leave the meeting. And uh, I would just take a couple minutes and just uh, watch for the participants and then I'll give you the go ahead when we're in closed session. 
we are turning off the live stream and the recording for this closed session. All right, we'll wait for your go ahead.